Close your eyes, we're about to begin. I can sing while we're waiting for Stan. I can sing while we're waiting for Stan. Cause we're waiting for Stan. And it's good time to sing. I can sing while we're waiting for waiting for waiting for Stan. Ah. Woo. We're just going to do it. Even, Even if, if it's, it's garbage. Oh. <laughs> we're just going to do it. And we'll make it work. We are going to be as relaxed as humans can be. Well, things might. Leak I'm not out going to sing. Much. And you won't be a jerk. <laughs> what bum, the hell, bum, man? Bum. And you will. <laughs> That's a counterpoint. Welcome to the Draftsman Podcast, Welcome ladies indeed. and gentlemen. I am Stan Prokopenko, creator of Proko. I am Marshall Vandruff, art instructor. Yeah. Here we go. What's the subject today? The subject today is how to study perspective. Oh, okay. That's something that I'm interested in. It's uh, you too, huh? convenient that we yeah. have a uh, professional perspective teacher here. Ah. You. Yeah. You're a professional. You're going to be a professional perspective teacher soon. Uh, kind of. I'm going to have a few perspective lessons in my basics course. Okay. Bare minimum perspective. Okay. We did an episode on how to study anatomy. Mm -hmm. a month or so ago yeah and that more was more than that way more than a few several months through ago. the books we walked through the books we walked through all the ways people should how they should approach learning anatomy we didn't teach them anatomy mm -hmm. we taught them how to learn anatomy yeah this is gonna be the exact same thing except okay. perspective and oh jesus Whoa. christ <laughs> And we might walk them through fewer books i think we'll be less time on books and at the end yeah the what do you call it the um drum roll no the the debut the, the debut the, the introducing the the, <laughs> the premiere <laughs> the premiere <laughs> of the drawing the box checking ai app that this i'm is, been have been working on this is the proco box checking ai checking app. app ai yeah marshall the perspective expert is going to be tested with my app He's going to draw a bunch of boxes, and then we're going to run it through the algorithms. This is the test Robots. of whether the guy who teaches perspective can draw a box. I'm oh nervous. Oh, boy, Marshall. Whoa. Yeah, and people listening, we're going to have a link in the description of all the results. Yeah. So you just click on it, take a look. We're going to have all the boxes numbered. You're going to have cheers and jeers. What? I mean, you know, if, he, if I do one that actually passes the test of AI and say, ah, you got it. Yeah, we'll see. I don't what, know. do you, you get percentages? Like if you're 90% there? No, it doesn't grade you. It literally just overlays the correct version of oh, the okay. box that you drew. Yeah. That's all it does. Okay. Yeah, we're starting with one specific task. We're going to expand on it later. Because this is about as simple as you can get. Yeah, for check perspective. a box. And it doesn't have to be a cube, just a box. Just a box, right. Yeah. right. Anyway, I'll explain more of how it works later. That'll okay, be at yeah. the end of the episode. For now, let's teach people how they can study or learn anatomy. Okay. No, perspective. Perspective. <laughs> yes. Okay. Marshall, you start. I'll start by telling everybody something that I've said many times before, which is that I didn't learn perspective until I was 28 years old. And people said, it may be that you can't learn it after 28. If you didn't what? learn it was younger, it's like trying to learn a new language. And I thought, no, I'm going to learn this. I knew that I needed it. I've told that story before. Wow. You I, didn't learn perspective until you were 28? No. And, and here's why. They had a perspective class at the junior college that I did not take. And then when I wanted to take it, the teacher who taught it didn't want to teach it anymore because most teachers don't want to teach perspective the way most professional writers don't want to teach grammar. Oh, and that makes sense. <laughs> there were all sorts of other teachers who couldn't teach it. Uh, because it's, it was sort of a lost art in the seventies. Mm -hmm. If you 
were old enough to have studied it earlier. I tried to study it from books, and I started with a book that my rendering teacher suggested. It was by Joseph D'Amelio, and I could not understand that book. It's a good book, but I couldn't understand it because I was one of those students who in junior high couldn't get through the algebra course. Mm -hmm. And like another, a number of other people in our class, uh, the boys, girls got through the algebra course and boys couldn't for some reason. But we what? had, in order to alleviate it, because you like had to take algebra, to they had a pre-algebra course. And the, so they funneled those of us boys who couldn't get through algebra into the pre-algebra course. And I learned nothing about pre-algebra because our teacher was a newly married woman who told us more about her wow. and her husband's sex life than she did teach us pre-algebra because I don't even think she knew algebra and we all managed to pass that course. And I was so relieved, I'll never have to study math again. My yeah. brain just didn't work that way. And so trying to understand it was really difficult for me. And the way wow. I learned it is that there was another guy who taught perspective and I was teaching basic drawing and I thought, if I teach it, I'll learn it. And I came to him and said, you're teaching perspective. Would you be willing to swap your... But yes, I would. Because he did not want to teach perspective anymore. Mm -hmm. So that was how I did it. I taught it five semesters. And, and now I, nobody has come up to you and offered the same thing. And you're still teaching perspective. Is uh, that the story? Actually, yeah. When I stopped <laughs> teaching other people, there were some uh, oh. some of my students. In fact, some of my students have become Ooh. perspective teachers. Nice. Yeah, one of them is doing a perspective boot camp. Well, because you're a good teacher. Uh, well, also, I really got into perspective and started to find out that it was it was fun. Yeah. But it's tough, and I think yeah. most students neglect it because it's tough. Because math. Because, they, yeah, they feel I'm not good at math. And, and perspective is quantifiable, but it is also like puzzles. Yeah, but a lot of perspective, I mean, yeah, a lot of perspective is math, but it gets fun when you start trying to make it in, intuitive. Yes. And then it becomes a much more just visual and less calculation and more visually correct, kind of like how shapes and values and all that stuff can be yeah. the book that changed it around for me this was in the 80s uh, J joseph d Emilio's book i still do recommend but you here's what happens you may be just at the very beginning it may be too tough to grasp ernest norling has two perspective books one of them is perspective made easy that was a good one joseph d Emilio's book is good but the one that changed it around for me was the one that I read the summer before I was going to teach the fall semester of it and it was Ernest Watson's book that's Watson of Watson Guptill and it was retitled how to use creative perspective Dover now publishes it if you want these books go to my website at martialart.com under reviews and go to the section called draftsmanship and I'll give you the list of books that I recommend of course Scott Robertson's is high on the list now yeah. but Scott Robertson's is a tough book it's more advanced yeah. that creative perspective by Ernest Watson if you are willing to give it two or three months of attention is a great book for beginners uh, for either really smart beginners or people who have gone through something a little more room trip, people who've gone through your perspective basics or your I memo. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> but when you do it, okay. if you do that first, I would guess the next thing would be to go to Ernest Watson. But let me okay. tell you what Ernest Watson got at, that the theory of how perspective works should be about one portion for something like 50 portions of practical exercises. And his, right from the beginning, explains that Masters of perspective don't think about accuracy. They get it into their subconscious where the, when they draw a line, they aim it away or know that it's coming toward it and they feel it, it they feel it out so that it becomes intuitive, which is what you're mentioning. Yeah. And I don't know what it was about Ernest Watson's writing, but when he explained this, I thought that makes sense. You learn perspective to forget it mm -hmm. and he called it creative perspective because by the second half of the book he's showing you you don't follow the rules at all you use what you know about how to bend these rules to make effects yeah and Kim Jong -gi. Uh, yes he doesn't plot anything out he, yeah. it's completely intuitive perspective because he knows it so well he yeah. can visualize it 
Now, I know that since my time, there are all sorts of good, per- that, that good books on perspective. That one on perspective of comic book artists I thought was really good. I think Marco's book on, uh, on uh, framed perspective. Uh, I haven't read those books from cover to cover, but they seem Neither. like they're really good to me. Yeah, I've flipped through them and I've looked at a lot of the visuals and they all look really good. Yeah. So there's all sorts of resources in books. However, books are a hard way to learn it. So video lessons can be uh, be better. But I'm wandering off. What was I going back? Well, oh, I, know, I knew lessons. that I needed to learn it. You're working on a perspective course. I am. But you already have one. Yeah. In well, the meantime. Let's, let's, should we start with the one that I'm working on first? <laughs> Ah, uh, maybe not because you probably will never finish it. No, I will finish it. Are you God sure? Willing. That's what you said to me five years ago. I know. Okay, then let me give my excuse. <laughs> Here is, it, it's, it's six years ago. Six years? We started wow. on this six years ago. Wow. Stan and I were talking about doing a course together and we finally decided on doing a perspective course because I'd wanted to redo the perspective course that I'd already done on video. Yeah. And so I got to work on it and I got to work on it with no results. And there were a couple of times where you were getting irritated with, come on, is this ever going to happen? But I want to explain why it took two years to produce nothing is that I figured this is the last time I'm going to teach perspective. It's going to be a Proco course. I want to make sure our mission statement that we wrote together is that the 11 year old will take this course and understand everything that you would learn in the highest level perspective courses Mm -hmm. and see if we can get that for an 11 year old. And the most important thing was the macro structure of the course, where to start, way to make sure we don't introduce this, but people aren't going to understand it. And so I worked on the outline, the macro outline for a long time, and I eventually was happy with it. Yeah. And then we had the big pl- pieces in, in, uh, in, in, in place. And I'm doing this essentially on the side. I'm not making my living with it yet. So that's why it's taking so long. But the big pieces are in place. We're getting little portions of it put together. And it's moving along. I am committed that if I die right after it comes out, <laughs> that uh, there, there'll be a million 11 year olds who say, I want a master perspective. And they will know what they need to know by the time they're, they're 12 or 13 because I'll walk you through the process with as little tripping as possible. Should I explain what the structure Yes, is? I, I mean, uh, I don't want this episode to just be about like, hey, go watch my perspective lecture and wait for my perspective course. I think we should, yeah. we should summarize and tell them what they need to learn. Yes. Yeah, do it. There are all sorts of ways to learn perspective, all sorts of ways to go at it. The most common way is you start with, with depth measuring tricks. And the depth measuring tricks, if that's all, if you had a crash course in perspective, I've got one or two weeks to learn perspective, go for the depth measuring tricks. There are five of them. Okay. That's one of them. The most common one is you say, I've got picket fences that are going back in space. How do I make it accurate? And you establish the relationship of the first two, and then you run diagonals through a center of that back pick it not through the top through the center of it and it'll find the one behind it and you continue to do that and do that and do that every perspective course teaches this and they usually teach it early on and they teach you not only with a perspective uh, picket fence but it works with the ceiling and it works with floor tiles and it works it on any axis that you're aiming back and to do a bunch of that sensitizes you to how things get smaller as they go away which is a first principle of perspective diminution mm-hmm but it depends on how close you are to things. So it gets more complicated than that trick, but at least that trick will get you thinking flat surface, measure back, have control of it. So people shouldn't start by learning about one point perspective, two point and then three point and just understanding that kind of stuff. Uh, That is the, that is usually the very first thing introduced. Okay. And that's valuable. Uh Huh? But one of the problems I've had with perspective teachers that teach one point, two point, and three point perspective is that they don't explain why. One point is specifically for when you're looking right at the face of something and it's going back to only one point and as soon as anything swivels, my head might be in one point perspective to this camera, but as soon as it swivels one way or another, the block that it represents means things that are going, that we're just going left to right are now going left to right and away. And so when a block swivels, when you step off the railroad track, so you're looking at an angle, 
you introduce a second point that is necessary. Yeah. And as soon as you look down extremely on something or up extremely at something, as long as we're still using the block as the fundamental, you introduce a third point. And third, three point perspective did not get popular, I'm told, until skyscrapers came in <laughs> and helicopters came in because now we've got more extreme views. And so they just uh, pretty much left it out of most art history. It was still yeah. there. But the biggest thing about three point perspective is that we see almost everything in three point perspective in life. And I know that sounds advanced, but what Kim Jong-gi said in that AI Inland Empire lecture that he did in 2014 is that he didn't really learn one, two, and three point perspective. He just learned the cube and how to spin it around. And I think that is the most practical way is you figure you got three axes. We have a three dimensional world. You have three dimensions. They are the things that go this way, this way, and this way. You can boil them down to a block. A block is useful to keep track of those three dimensions and everything in the world can be found as a compromise between those three dimensions. What this means is that the foundation of understanding perspective is to understand the block and specifically the cube because it says it's such a simple one by one by one uh, aspect ratio. So once you've got that, then you've got these things that will be useful for the next thing, which is curves, which are complicated. Mm. And that's cylinders. And these cylinders each will be aiming at an axis that determines the position, openness, and uh, that's the called eccentricity and angle of those ellipses. And you cannot master, it's no, no way to master those ellipses until you've got some idea of them on a block to keep track of. It's how your 3D program does it. And it's how Artists have been doing it yeah. for hundreds of learn, years. Learn cylinders by learning boxes. Yeah. So I, I start with right angles, learn about what a right angle is, and then a block has three sets of right angles. And then the round things that we put on that block open up a whole new world of complexity. All of these curves that are manageable curves now because we place them on a block and then all of the compromises in between mean that we've got what a, what a 3D program can do. It can figure out where any plane is yeah. and that is purely line and it is with that knowledge of line, sections, uh, cross contours, whatever you call them, that we will then have the ability to predict how light will fall on it by figuring if the light source was from this angle, now I know which plane is facing away from the light. The fact is, on a flat surface, no plane is facing away from the light. So it is an illusion to say inside that world of these wire frames that I've built, I can pretend like there's a light in there and it will make the shade happen over here. Robert Beverly Hale's term that it's illusionary drawing. Yeah. You're creating the illusion of 3D on a 2D surface. That's what it's all about. And so how do we do that with the science of perspective, which is predictable, it's manageable, it can be learned. It can be learned in six months to three years, depending on how much energy and how much brightness you've got in understanding this kind of stuff. And anyway, we go from right angles to curves and then to making those things that are machine-like start to look organic, which happens by combining them together. You know. Glenn Vilpu's teaching, the figure as spheres, the figure as blocks, the figures as the figure as spheres and blocks combined. Yeah. The figure as cylinders. That is essentially applying perspective to a yeah. human body. And it's the foundation of what I think almost all perspective teaching should, should be. Drew Struzan was the one who pointed out to me when he saw my technical illustrations. He said, you know how to apply this perspective uh, to machines. But the same thing applies to a head, spirals of hair, hands, arms, shoulders. And that was what opened, opened up the practicality of knowing perspective when you're doing organic things. Yeah. Is that the whole course? No. The Proco course is divided into the first half is how perspective works. Okay. It is theory. There's there are practical aspect to it, but it's mainly if you skipped over the first half, you could still master perspective, but you might not want to skip over the first half because okay. we are going to lay a foundation of how you look at something through an eye. And if you can see it from above, see it from the side, see it from below, see it from different angles and why it goes through a picture plane. And when the camera gets closer and the camera gets further back, it changes. And there is no perspective course that has ever given more attention to this 
this point of view of proximity, how close you are. We're making a big deal out of that because concept uh -huh. artists can use that, storyboard artists can use that, anybody can use that. It's the difference between a wide angle view that where you're close up and a telephoto view where everything's compressed down. There'll be a lot of the theory and understanding how it works and then the second half of the course is just the practical knowledge of learning how to draw all these forms and spin them around and turn them into what you want to invent. Is that going to be a little more intuitive? Well, let's put it this way. If you paid attention in the first half of the course, yeah. in the second half of the course, you're still going to work your brain real hard, but you're also going to move toward, now I can sit down and sketch. Like when Kim Jong-gi does that cup that you're looking down on, and he tips it one way and tips yeah. it another way. He's giving the simplest scaffolding for you know, where my eye is. Mm -hmm. And that it becomes very practical and very useful in the second half of the course. Cool. And I don't introduce the depth measuring uh, systems, the depth measuring tricks until three quarters, oh, five, right. six of, through the course. And I've done this before in teaching it live. And students, when they get those depth measuring systems later, now they stick forever because they know why this is happening. Mm. And so, oh gosh, now I've got it. I'm off and running for practical drawing. So, is that the whole summary of the, yeah, that's the, the course? Yeah, um, is that pretty much what your lectures are like? Because the, the, how much is it? $11 or $12? Oh, no. The... My lectures, I did, the last time I taught perspective at the junior college was in 1994. And I was teaching one night a week and I spent 20 hours a week preparing those lectures, even though I'd done them many times. And I went in there and did these lectures and we recorded them with an eight millimeter home video yeah. uh, camera. And those are available to you now. You say, I want you to teach me perspective, Marshall. I did the best job I'd ever done up until that point for 12 bucks. You can get those at my website. They're me and a chalkboard. And so they are not impressive, but I completely rewrote my approach to perspective for Proco. Okay. So it's not the same thing. It is not the same train of thought. It's, I rewrote it so that if we've got the advantage of doing these as Proco productions, yeah. That it's a whole different way to do it. And I feel like once I'm done with that, okay, that's the last word that I've got to say on it. And then I, I'm, I don't ever need to ever teach it again, right? Mm -hmm. You pay a few hundred bucks and you're going to get more a perspective than you could ever get in a school that was devoted to it for semesters. Cool. Yeah. Is there anything else that they need to know about learning how to draw per in perspective? No. We start from the beginning. But there no, no, no. Like from not counting that course, considering that they're, they're not going to take your course, mm -hmm. how, they can, how can they learn perspective? Nothing else they need to know, but something that students need to do. Cool. And something that I have not done most of my life. It is to practice control of lines, longer lines. That is to be able to put the pen down, touch the paper, and control this line freehand. It is not necessary, but it's certainly valuable. You can use straight edges, but I do not recommend that you learn perspective with T-squares and triangles and straight edges, at least not exclusively. That's instrumental perspective. It's what I'll teach you in the first half of the Proco course. It's valuable to know, but the problem with it is that I've had students in my animal drawing course and other courses, they've taken perspective, but the only kind of perspective they've taken is with a T-square, a triangle, doing things through the picture plane, plotting all those points, and when it comes to trying to draw a mannequin and put a rubber band around it, they don't have any clue how to do it. Mm. And so freehand practical perspective of spinning a cube around into different positions and drawing it freehand and letting it not be accurate. Just letting me be good enough. Letting it look accurate. L look accurate enough, enough. Yeah. to help tell the story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I lo there's a lot of drawings and sketching styles that I can see that the perspective is not accurate mm -hmm. intentionally. I mean, a lot of animations have that where the, yeah. you know, things are curved and, and converging in the wrong way and it looks cool. In the Warner Brothers cartoons, they'll have Elmer Fudd turn to the camera and as he said something, he'll emphasize and his head gets bigger as <laughs> if he got six feet closer to the camera. It's amazing and those, those are examples of I'm messing around with proximity effect even in a way that it isn't possible. Yeah. yeah. That's, the, that's Ernest Watson's approach. Learn it and then just mess around. Hey, right. there's an analogy. 
you learn to count rhythm as a musician with a metronome, for example. Okay. No professional musician needs a metronome anymore. You internalize the rhythms enough to where you will vary them. It's a human heartbeat. It's a person getting more excited, slowing down a little bit. But all of that comes out of the musician's feelings and instincts, no longer out of the need to conform to the metronome. It's a good metaphor. Thanks. It's the whole thing about juggling too many balls. What, how do you mean? You, in, you have way too many things to, to juggle when you're learning yeah. a complicated thing like drawing. Yeah. And so, in order to do all of them at the same time, you need to practice each one enough to where it becomes intuitive. Yeah. And then you're not thinking about it. Yeah. It's your subconscious that does it for you. And you're just thinking about the story you're trying to tell or the character that you're doing. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll go back to something that R.B. Hale mentioned in Drawing Lesson from the Great Masters about rendering, about light on form, that you would spend an evening with white paper and turning it into a cylinder and looking at how the light plays around it and getting some primitive forms and noticing how light moves around. And he said something to the effect that if you are going to spend your life as an artist, you should spend one evening doing this. <laughs> and perspective takes at least 20 to 30 hours of work to get your head around it, to master it, at least a hundred hours, maybe two or three hundred hours. But let's 10, say ten thousand hours. Pardon? Ten thousand hours? No, no, no. It does not take ten thousand hours to cool. learn perspective, to master perspective. But at least a hundred hours, and maybe two or three hundred. Now think about this: uh, two or three years from now, that time is going to go by anyway, and you're going to com continue to avoid learning it because it's tough. I think that the immersion in it early on from the people who are willing to say, I want to learn this and enjoy it, that's a great secret of perspective. If you can treat these three axes that it's all based on, height, width, and depth, think of them as poles all at right angles to each other from different positions. If you can treat learning those the way you approach a crossword puzzle, crossword puzzles take energy, people spend hours doing them and they Im improve their vocabulary a little bit or their knowledge of cultural trivia. But this is to do it so that you have command of something that most artists avoid. And if you immerse yourself in this enough to say, I'm going to get a gri grip on it, then by the time you're done, you are in a category of very few artists mm -hmm. who know this and can yeah. put it to use in their work. Yeah. I mean, when you put it that way, where 20 to 30 hours gives you a good grasp of it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem so bad. Right. And if you've got a few friends that are doing it with you, yeah. then it's uh, turn it into games. One of the weaknesses of the 1994 course that I did is it doesn't have any assignments in it. And the Proco course we're going to do is going to have a lot of assignments in it. There's going to be assignment every every lesson. Yeah. Yeah. But you, if you're inventive, you say, I don't want to do perspective because I'm creative and perspective is so left-brained. Mm. Well, if you're creative, here's how you can prove your creativity. Take those lectures that don't have any assignments and make up your own assignments. Be creative about how I would master Ooh. this by creating some games. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Boom. Okay, we're done. Cool. Are you ready? I'm ready. What do I got to do? All right. So, let's start off. Draw me a bunch of boxes. They do not have to be cubes. Uh-huh. They could be elongated. Okay. But they can be cubes if you want them to be cubes. Okay. No construction lines. No I'm construction sorry. lines. Right. It does. We haven't done that yet. It, it it'll get confused. That makes it harder. It makes it harder. And I can't do the lines. You think you told me you? I can't do the lines that are on the other side of the cube. No transparent boxes. Transparent boxes are the only way to learn how to draw boxes accurately but i'm not learning here i'm trying to say no, you're forget testing about your I'm intuitive my, okay intuitive ability to sketch boxes okay if you're if you're sketching i mean i think you do this you you do draw through the box and you I draw on the other side but i think most people the don't box. they draw the surface of what it will end up being if it's if you're sketching in ink 
Well, anyway, let's, let's the, the just... whole point is that this is an early stage. This is beta stage of our app. Mm -hmm. And it does one very, very specific thing. It's got a lot of limitations. I just don't want you to break it because I know what, what I know what will break it. I have the power to break the well, AI. Well, it won't break. It just won't work. Okay. There's no point. It's like you can draw a circle and it won't know what you're trying to do here. It'll be like, uh, mm -hmm. error. So, don't do that. Don't draw a circle. Okay. <laughs> but the idea is there will never be more. There'll never be more than nine lines. If... Yeah. Nine lines is the max. So, I've, I've all, that makes it sound easier. You've <laughs> well, only got to place li nine lines. Those nine yeah. lines have to work okay. together perfectly. All right. Um, now, the app does allow you to use either one, two, or three point perspective. Okay. Since you're a pro, let's just do three. Point I just perspective. tend to draw in you three point. Three. Even when I'm thinking in one point perspective, I am aware that I'm making the line go away and I try to make sure it doesn't diverge as it goes away. Yeah. Which is a primary sin. Is that if the line's supposed to be going away, it shouldn't be diverging if it's supposed to be a right angle line. Yeah. Okay. All right. So draw me a bunch of boxes, Marshall. All right. I will. Mm, I can tell I ran into trouble there. Uh, that's our front. Oh, gosh. Doing it in pencil means that there can be forgiveness. Doggone it. I want to test these things before AI does by doing the third dimension through there. Since I didn't plot the vanishing points, there is no guarantee they're right. The AI is going to say, yeah, you made them taper. But you made them taper according to your whim and not according to the truth that we computers know. And after we fussed with it to the point where I should be embarrassed, maybe I'm not embarrassed because when you're fighting a war, all you care about is winning. And there's no room for embarrassment. The embarrassment comes after when you look at the video of it and see how badly you fought that war. Aren't you embarrassed? Yeah, I am now. But when I was in there, you don't know how hard it was. No. Oh, well, I can tell some of these are off and I could, if I could do my construction lines, it would help. But this yeah. is... Yeah, I know you can draw a perfect box. If given you, enough time given and enough construction, time and enough construction yeah. lines. We're just testing the app here. It's, it'd be good if you make some mistakes so that we can oh, see that it's yeah, correcting that's right. you. Oh, yeah, that's right. I meant every mistake. Yeah, thanks for throwing in some mistakes in there. Mark. Yeah, well, you know, perfection gets boring. Why am I nervous? Because you're about to be analyzed by a robot. Oh, boy. These are good. I don't think you're going to be that far off, Marshall. But it doesn't tell, it just shows, it doesn't give us a percentage, it just shows you. you it were, just overlays the correct overlays the box. And I assume it does it by finding three lines that converge and figuring they didn't hit that vanishing point, or they did. It figures, if it's got two lines that it knows are trying to converge, it's going to find a point. And then it's going to say that third line. Let's see if it converges there. Something like that. <laughs> And it's got to look at the context to know whether they're trying to go away, whether those lines are going away to a vanishing point or whether they're coming towards you. Yeah. You know? First, it has to detect lines. It has to detect <laughs> lines and make logic out of them. I'm not going to go into how it works. Yeah. You might that's have your a, competitors saying, oh. No, no, no. That's not why. Um it's a long conversation, but yes, basically it, it looks for convergence. It it creates vanishing points based on your lines mm -hmm. and then it draws a box with those vanishing points. Can I ask a technical question? Sure. Might be, this might be When it detects vanishing points in two-point perspective, for example, when it detects them, does it then figure out that there is a horizon line connecting those two vanishing points? And that horizon line should be at right angles no, to the third axis? Because it doesn't have to be. Well, it does if it's going to be correct. Why can't the box be tipped over a little bit? 
It can, but if it gets tipped over, it's going to carry the horizon line with it. Oh, Remember the right. Y line. Not the horizon line. Is it still called a horizon no, line? No, we, we, we call horizon? it a, I call it a carried horizon. I think a I carried took horizon. that from so a carried horizon. In other words, if you're going to do a tumbling box, this is one of the most common things. I learned one, two, and three point perspective on a horizon line. What happens when the thing tips around? Well, the horizon line is still important, but it's just you carry it with it. Every box that tumbles to master it, you imagine that it's carried its horizon with it. That's hard to To be honest, explain. I don't remember. Okay. I know that we were attempting to do that. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember if this, this version has that in it. Well, where if, it, well, it's not one horizon. It's three horizons. Yes, that's right. It would have three it horizons. It would have three horizons, yeah. If it doesn't have it in, in it, it's going to be more forgiving for my errors. Of where the vanishing point yeah. should go. Yeah, because as long as you're aiming toward a vanishing point, you're going to miss a little bit. It's all oh, got okay, pretty close. Mm -hmm. As soon as it brings in the other criteria of those two vanishing points, they'd better be on a line that's at right angles with your center. We can check. Okay. When we look at the results, because yeah. we'll see the vanishing points that it, it that it plotted. Yeah. And we'll be able to see if it's parallel or perpendicular to the, yeah. the hor hor uh, what is it perpendicular called? Perpendicular to the Y line. The Y line. Yeah. yeah. In, in training students now, that last round of students that I train in perspective that got so good, I have them do 20 cubes where you actually you spin the cube around and you find the carried horizon and you make sure that that horizon is at right angles to your center Y line and it heightens your sensitivity to when you're sketching to know how wrong it is. Oh, they both aim at vanishing points. Yeah, but the vanishing points are arbitrary. And as soon as you've, when, mm. when I look at these ones that I did, I can tell they're off and I can tell they're off mainly because my carried horizon is not at right angles to my Y line. But okay. to get that correct, you've got to do some fussing with it to say, okay, that looks a little better or else you've just got to actually take the time to draw the entire horizon line, run the vanishing points back. Yeah. run the Y line up and make sure that they're at right angles. But that's all a lot of gobbledygook to a person who does not already know what it means. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's be... true. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, we're sorry. <laughs> but anyone, I, I know that people who know perspective really well would listen to that and say, I know what exactly what's it mean, what it means. If we include it in the podcast at all, it means that a, a bright and curious student could say, I'm going to slow that down and understand everything in there. And that's going to be my guide to understanding how, yeah, why you draw all those carried horizons. Oh, man. Well, I am excited. We're going to go scan these. Okay. And run them through. Okay. And we'll be right back. We're yeah. going to have the day of judgment. All right. This episode is sponsored by Proco Drawing Lessons. If you want to learn how to draw, if you want to improve your knowledge of figure drawing and figure anatomy, look no further than Proco.com. There are hundreds of free lessons on our YouTube channel, but the premium courses over at Proco.com slash store have more detailed videos and a lot of assignment demonstrations. Our anatomy course also includes 3D models of all the bones and muscles that you can rotate around and study from right in your browser. It has PDF eBooks for each lesson, so you can review the information whenever you want to come back to it. And if you're looking to save some money, we have several discounted package deals. Head over to Proca.com and start learning. Oh, the results are in, Marshall! Wow. Marshall, the results are here. All right, I'm gonna share this folder with you, Marshall. Okay. If you scroll down to cube number six, Oh, that brilliant. one looks like it's just a perfect overlay. So you you made like no mistakes. Yeah, I got real close on that one. See that one's like yeah. almost no. Yeah. Mistake okay. On that well, one. good. I'm glad for that. Um, What's well, the one that's the worst off? Is twenty three. This one that I tried forced perspective on. Oh, I see what went wrong, and the blue lines are the correction. Yeah. And I know exactly what happened there. It's that line on the right. Oh, that one is really far that off. I, I made it converge with the front corner line too soon. And I said, look, if you're going to make those converge there, the one over on the left has to converge there also. And so it forced those other lines into conformity. If I had not gotten that line on the right so off, it yeah. might have allowed me to put the vanishing point, the third point vanishing point down there way further away, which is what I was intending to do. I just made it taper too much is what it comes down to. Yeah. That one is interesting. This one, I feel like it actually messed up. 
Because why did it also shrink the size of the box? Because if the vanishing point is that close, according to the two vertical lines on the right, it's finding a close vanishing point. So it's saying that means that vertical line on the left has got to hit at the same point. Yeah. And so but why it's did a, it make it less tall? I think that it discerned what the proportions were that I was aiming for. And it said, we can't make it a long, long, skinny thing. Okay. I think. I'm not sure it actually yeah. does it, but maybe. But I do That's see interesting. I do see its logic. I haven't seen this res this kind of result before. Yeah. It is correct. The, the, the box that it drew, is that a correct box to hey, you? Uh, it's hard to tell because of the illusion that's happening. No, no. You know why it's not a correct box? Oh, no. It doesn't have that Y line perpendicular to the horizon line thing going on. It doesn't have that carried horizon awareness. But I it might does. be... Which I, one's off? If you were to run a line through the center of the box... Yeah. ...down to a vanishing point... I don't think it would be at right angles to the X and Z, the, the left and right and front and back lines. Uh, but that's too... Exp uh, people uh, listening to this are just going to be driven crazy. Go down to 22.7. No, you're 7. right. Go down to 22.7 and I think you'll see something that no, you're is right. more telling. Look at how the correction creates more convergence as it goes down but it does not change the size. It doesn't change the height of the block. You know why? Because hmm. I got that line on the right, the vertical line on the right, more correct. So it didn't have to distort everything as much to fix it. Yeah, this is really in the early stages, isn't it? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so basically the point, it's, it's just con correcting your convergence. That's all it, yeah. Look at uh, box 18 and look at how that corrected cube. Oh, that's way off. No, that, that messed up. Something happened. Jesus that's, that, is, that is purely. Here's why I, why I said this obviously in the early stages. The next thing that has to be figured into this is that your Y line, the one we call vertical, has to be at right angles. Oh, no. I'm looking at the steps it took. Yeah. For some reason, it detected two lines where it should have detected one, oh. and it completely threw off the okay. whole thing. That one, it was not the correction stage that went wrong. It was the line detection stage. Okay. Well, yeah, you can tell that. Yeah. Wow, some of the forced ones that I did, would, did good. go to number 12. That was one that I was afraid was going to be really distorted. Yeah. That because one it's a wide angle really lens, well. and yet it, it seems to like it. Yeah. But look, at it, it corrected you correctly, I think. Like at the very top edge, yep. you can see that you kind of curved it and you dipped it a little bit and yep. it corrected right. that. And then on the bottom right edge, it looks like you're giving a little lip, like you're curving that yeah. plane out. Yeah. And it, it straightened it. And sliced that it. off. Oh, number 11 came really close too. Yeah. Most of these seem to have worked. Okay. Right? Yes. And I didn't mean to be critical no, of the good. thing you've put so much energy into. <laughs> that's what we're but doing. Yes, it's we have to take baby steps. And the extreme version of this, you figure before there was radio and podcasts, there were telegraphs. And they had to do just dots and dashes to get stuff out. When this comes to its extreme version, what it means is that you would put this down and it would know everything about it. It would tell you how far the focal length was, how close you were to it, what uh, angle cropped the image at that size. You would know everything about it. We're headed to the point that you were talking about in the AI podcast, mm -hmm. which is that you would do a dozen of these and it would say, here's where you were off and here's what you need to work on. You need to work on convergence. Let's get that word together. So we're going to do a whole bunch of these. Now you've done convergence. You got them perfect. But they're converging at vanishing points that don't make any sense because they're right. not on a horizon line. And so now we're going to work on that. You've got to do a whole bunch of y, perpendicular Y lines to the horizon. Okay, now that you've got that, you don't seem to be in control of your focal length and how close you are to this. So we're going to do a whole bunch of these things where you're going to move the vanishing points in, move the vanishing points out. So it's immediately in touch with every error you make and it diagnoses exactly what kind of exercises you need to do. And it might even get so advanced that it can predict when it's worked with you for a while, 
you need to do 20 of these exercises. Now, these ones, you only need to do six of these exercises. Oh, wow. I mean, it could get that smart, right? That it can, it it can could, estimate. Yeah. I, the AI art teacher could be, start to create curriculums based on your previous history of learning stuff. Yeah. The way your traffic map on your smartphone can tell you you got the option of the shorter route, the, that is, the shorter route that is longer, the longer route that is faster, and the route that doesn't make any toll uh, right. tolls. And it figures it all out and gives you your, your yeah. recommendations. Right now, the only part of this that is actually AI mm -hmm. is the line detection. I want to show you something. Okay. What we did, so the AI part of it works so well. I'm, I'm like, I was amazed because I could barely see the lines that someone drew mm -hmm. and it detected them. What we did was we drew a box, very thin uh, ink, mm -hmm. and then we crumpled up the paper and we unfolded it. And you got all these shadows and yeah. like these edges all over the place and it detected what are the lines and what are just folds in the paper. Was that Very luck well. or did you teach no. it to you could, discern you do that between 20 crumples. times and it'll work? No, we didn't teach it to discern um, folded paper. Okay. We fed it a bunch of images with noise and lines that shouldn't be detected, lines that should be. Okay. Uh, and it just, we just trained it with this data. Okay. So for example, if you draw on a on grid paper mm -hmm. or on paper with lines, well, with like, you know, horizontal lines, mm -hmm. it'll remove those lines and it'll count only the lines that you drew. Okay. Because that part of it, that's the AI, it just, it's good at that. So, you're, you're discovering that some parts of it are really smart. Yeah. Some parts it just does great. Yeah, the parts that are not AI are the parts that calculate the vanishing points. That's just, we're just using math to okay. figure that stuff out. But So, Marshall, let me show you. This works. It's okay. able to detect. The lines in the background versus those. Uh, wow. Oh, it got shadow shadows, all over there and it can still figure it out. That. It just looks for the highest contrast. Look at that or a, image. Wow. You can barely see That's the amazing. Line. It gets rid of all those shadows and it. It just and it did alive. this without you having to teach it. That one as well. Well, we trained it with noise and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, to look for the highest contrast of something that goes consistent. Not high contrast anything. We just said, here's, a, here's an image and we told it where the lines are. That's, and then we gave it like a, a few thousand of those. Mm -hmm. And all it knows is this is an image. These are the results. It decides how it gets, how it should get to the results. Okay. We don't tell, tell it to look for high contrast areas, look for this sort of stuff. We literally just give it data. And then it, it, it decides, learns to discern. It learns, it gives itself reasons. Okay. It learns its own reasons. We don't even know why it does this stuff. Wow. It comes up with its own reasons. It appears to be multiplying. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty fun to see that kind of stuff work. Okay. Anyway, we're going to be improving this thing all the time. Um, and I think by the time this episode comes out, um, you guys will be able to test it out on your own. Um, Great. And, and when they test it out on their own, you are always improving it? Does it give you more not data? All, I mean, we, yeah, we're, we're improving it, but not like on a, we're not uploading the improvements on like on a daily basis. Right. But all, every, all the tests that people do over oh, yes. time are going to make everything work better. Yes, absolutely. Hit, okay. The whole point of releasing this right now at its early stages is for all this beta testing mm -hmm. so that we can see more of what real people are actually doing and what problems we need to solve. Mm -hmm. What is throwing it off? What's causing it to have errors? Mm -hmm. It's going to break a lot. Like when you guys go on there and you, and you try it out, it's going to probably give you funny results a lot of it, a lot of the time because it is beta. Um, but it's fun. It's fun to just like throw something in there and see what happens. Box.proco.com okay. is where they can go to test this out. All right. And have fun. Hey guys, this is Future Stan. I did a beta test round with a small group of people from my newsletter and the results were mixed. Some people were able to upload a bunch of boxes and got great corrections all around. Some very exciting results. And some people uploaded five boxes and got errors on all five. I know you probably want to try it out for yourself, but the app needs work.
We're going to improve it, and when we launch the next version, it'll be at box.proco.com. Okay, bye. This reminds me that when automobiles were first available, I'm told, everybody that would go for Sunday drives and they had to hand crank these things to get them started. The tires would blow out. They had to fix the tires themselves while they were out there. It was just a hassle. But people went out for Sunday drives even more than they do now. And if it had not been through mm. all of those iterations of developing the automobile, we would not have cars that we have now that we hardly even think about them because we get in and we turn an ignition and we go. Yeah. So this is these early stages that are going to lead to later stages where feedback of objective criteria for learning your skills as an artist is going to be as efficient as anybody ever imagined. That's a good pitch. It's great. I'm excited <laughs> nice. about it. Yeah, me too. It means that the next generation of artists could be greater than anyone in the Renaissance imagined possible. Well, you think about what Disney animators were doing in the 1930s from all of the research that they were doing to figure out how to make this work. If you had shown that to Renaissance artists, Baroque artists, I think they would have just fainted at what level drawing was going to come up to. Yeah. And I think that that's, we, we might do the same if we were to see 20, 30 years from now, what kind of skills young drafts people are going to have in their training by the time they're teenagers. I think it's all about increasing that feedback loop. Okay. Well, this was, I, I enjoyed this more than I thought I was going to. Oh yeah? Yeah. Nice. It's sort of the celebration of the left brain. You were afraid that it was going to expose your weaknesses, but instead you exposed its weaknesses. Oh, well, isn't that Look great Look at too? you. Yeah. You perspective teacher. Yeah. <laughs> Paul Bunyan <laughs> triumphed over the machine for one round. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you for your help. It was enjoyable. I'm going to improve it. Okay. And uh, thank you guys for listening. Go learn some perspective. Leave five stars yes. on iTunes and... What's the... What's the comments? Comment. What do you wish AI could do for you? Oh, man. <laughs> That's going to lead to some really weird conversations. It could or it could be something good. We'll see. We'll yeah. see whether our... If you had any faith in humanity... Let's try to keep it productive, guys. Yeah. If Not you were, the if, obvious thing. If you were going to be the greatest artist that you could be, your highest potential that you feel like you've got in you, what do you wish... AI would do. Some people might be insightful and creative on this. They may yeah, give us things so. nobody else ever thought of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Bye, Marshall. See you next week. See you next week. Close your eyes. We're about to begin. I can sing while we're waiting for Stan. I can sing while we're waiting for Stan, cause we're waiting for Stan, and it's good time to sing. I can sing while we're waiting for waiting for waiting for Stan. He can sing while we're waiting for Stan. For Stan. He can sing while we're waiting for waiting for Stan. He can sing while we're waiting. Sing while we're waiting. Sing while we're waiting for Stan. Wait for Stan. Yeah. Have you ever performed? No. In an audience? I'm not performing now. No. Because you're not recording this. I think they are. We're recording. Yeah. Oh, is that right? <laughs>